Please turn with me to the book of Genesis. Oh my gosh. The 32nd chapter. Starting at the 22nd verse. And then if you can't find Genesis, the doors of the church are open. <laughs> Genesis 32, 32 starting at verse 28. Please stand as is my custom for reading the word of the Lord. And then people, people don't stand that often anymore. We get accustomed to the word, that's why it's not pricking their heart like it used to. Uh, Genesis, the 32nd chapter, starting at the 22nd verse, and it reads as thus. During the night, Jacob got up and took his two wives and his two servant wives and his 11 sons, and he crossed the river with them. After taking them to the other side, he sent over all his possessions. This left Jacob alone in the camp. And a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. When the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of its socket. Then the man said, let me go for the dawn is breaking. Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man replied, what is your name? Jacob had the unmitigated gall to reply and answer. He said, my name is Jacob. The reply of the man said, you are no longer Jacob. From now on, you will be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Father God, your servant comes before you another time, blessing you, thanking you, lifting you up, magnifying you. Do it again, Lord. Decrease me. Hide me behind you. Let them see you and not me. Father God, you do it now. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. You can be seated. Please indulge me for about the next 30 minutes as I attempt to present a homily and a hermeneutically sound recitation of the text. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. yes. Uh, if I, if I had to have a topic, if I had to have something you could leave here with, look at your neighbor, help me declare my topic. Come on. My topic is, I am on trial. I am on trial. Uh-oh. Look at your other neighbor and say, neighbor. Neighbor. I am on trial. I am on trial. Malcolm X said, I had to learn early in life. That if you want something, you had better make some noise. By trade, I'm a community organizer specializing in policy and issue-based advocacy. And I have had the unique pleasure of speaking at churches in hopes of increasing the consciousness of black and brown lives to equip them to take part in their own liberation. Psalms 107 says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Psalm 34 says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Joshua 6 declares, After the sound of the trumpet, that the walls began to fall. It's imperative that we recognize the power of voice to bring awareness and the purpose of sound to bring change. Uh, I know I'm in the presence of a writer, so God bless you, Apostle Roach. <laughs> Um, but what is voice? I was in my time of studying and contemplation. Took me to the writer's definition of voice. Writers define the term voice as the sound and perspective mm -hmm. by which something is written. Sound to tone, rather, is the way something sounds to the reader. Mm -hmm. So for brief moments in time, the writer has to remove themselves from the equation and write the story from the perspective of the reader. 
Psalms echoes the sentiment of the Lord and says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. That was God using his sound to present the reason to be redeemed. Because now our sound, watch this, traveled from our current location to our future destination. Perspective or point of view is a position from which a writer writes. The Bible is full of various perspectives. The commandment, as we know, inhibits first, second, and third person point of view. Exodus 20 says, I am the Lord thy God. This is God putting himself in the equation never to be removed. You shall have no other gods before me. Speak the command. This is God putting us in the equation. We go all the way to Matthew 22. And it says, all the laws and the prophet hang on these. Third person. The idea that something is bigger than humanism itself. Come on. We go from putting God into a situation to him including us. Yes. To him including something bigger and everlasting. There is never a time that God does not include himself when the matter is life or death. The simple manifestation of God's unlimited authority and power rests in the assumption that nothing is too big for him. Nothing is too bold for him. Nothing has the capability to hold him down. Mm. Frederick Douglass stated, power can seize nothing without a demand. We have to learn to put a demand on something and not just cry about it. All right. Dr. Jamal Bryan suggests we have, it, we have to disavow the messianic complex of waiting for another Malcolm, of waiting for another Dr. King. He begins to declare, we, we now have to work instead of feel. His sentiments provoke, we have become accustomed to the organ instead of the pavement. Come on. Wow. We would rather hear about prosperity, wow. the seeming feeling of change, seeming feeling. instead of social action. The idea proposed in the scripture when it says, go out into the hedges and tell men of the good news of Come Jesus, on. and I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> Can I just push for a minute? Go ahead. Come on, push. Go ahead. Where is the justice for Freddie Gray? All right. Where is the justice for Sandra Bland? Oh. Where is the justice for Jeremy McDowell? Shot dead while in a wheelchair. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. The people ever stop to think why we are fighting for justice all over again? Again. Why we are facing racial discrimination all over again? Come on. Why do we live in a system where Jim Crow goes by another name? Oh, Simply mass incarceration. Why?